Here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, translucent versus opaque considerations before formulating, weighing in grams, and uh, uh, steam hurt heat versus dryer heat. Uh, oh, well. Uh, hi, Sharon. Hi, uh, Vincent. I hope you had an amazing Easter. I did, Vincent. I did my favorite thing in the world. Nothing. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see, okay, <clears throat> here we go, translucent versus opaque. Let's start with this topic, it's, it's pretty simple, I think, but not necessarily, very, very, very simply. The difference between translucent and opaque is that translucent color is lighter and opaque color of the same color is darker. But it's not quite that simple. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Vincent said already, uh, this is an important topic. I found many common colors many in, in use are, are too translucent. Um, there's a reason for that, Vincent, uh, before I go on. Um, translucent colors are, are lighter versions of the same color. And I actually prefer working with translucent colors as opposed to uh, opaque colors for two reasons, two main reasons. Uh, number one, translucent colors are more easily um changed or in other words i can make a translucent color deeper much easier than i can make an opaque color darker and it is particularly true when they're already on the hair if a color is too dark on the hair we know that 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 uh, lightening it often if not always brings up warm tones um, there are ways of doing it uh, that, that don't bring up warm tones. And um, eventually, if we haven't already, we'll talk about it. Um, I keep going. Um, generally, we think of a Euro European colors as being opaque uh, and American colors as being translucent, generally speaking. Uh, almost all European colors appear darker than American colors. And that's one of the reasons why people think there's great, there's gray coverage difference. Now, translucent does not mean less gray coverage. And opaque does not mean better gray coverage. They both result in gray coverage. However, the coverage is different. Let me go back for one second here. The color, nope, wrong way. The color is different. Now, about this point particularly, the coverage is different. If we have two colors and they are, one is an American light brown and the second color is a European light brown. Most people say that the European color covers gray better than the American color, uh, color. It's not that it covered it better, it's that it covered it differently. So you, you do have darker coverage with most European uh, colors, but that's because of the dye load. I'm going to go on and explain that a little bit better as we go on. So one shade of color can be either translucent or opaque, uh, but there are many different ways to create a formula where the tone is more translucent or more opaque. Now for a slightly more translucent formula, Here's the first thing. Now, this is what we were taught many, many years ago. Um, 
at the at the color institutes around uh, around the U.S. and particularly by the manufacturers, and that was you could add a little extra developer to a formula to get it just slightly more translucent or slightly lighter. It was the same color formula, but because you would add between seven and ten grams, it became of uh, uh, peroxide it became a slightly lighter version of the color. Not a lot, but just a little bit. Now, remember this one here. Once again, I'm talking about within the same level, I want to add between four and seven grams of a lightning cream, which means just simply any color, with anything without color in it, but does not contain a persulfate because persulfates destroy uh, color molecules. So if you add a small amount of XL cream to a formula, um, but maintain an equal amount of formulas, for instance, if I were to use um, 45 grams of uh, uh, a light brown color and then add five grams of XL cream to it, and then add an equal amount, which would be 60 grams of developer, it would be a slightly lighter version of, uh, um, of the color. And then you can add, or you can add, um, you can also add it to um, any sort of clear to deposit only or tonal formulas and keep the peroxide amount the same. Uh, wait a second here. I have Sharon said similar to some makeup artists' preferences for heavily pigmented shade that they blend out. Um, I'm just going to take your word on this, Sharon, because I don't know. Uh, I'm not. I, I don't know anything about uh, makeup and how it applies, but it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and as you as you work it out. Uh, it would be less intense. Makes perfect sense. But now for a slightly more opaque formula, remember the, 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 the last slide we looked at was for a more translucent formula. For a, a slightly more opaque formula. Now we were, we were uh, taught this particular thing to create a darker, color within the same level. This is going back to when I was in beauty school, which was 40 years ago. We were taught, taught to add a half of an ounce, which is what 15 grams is, of the next deeper color in the same level to 45 grams of the original color. So very simply, that would mean that if I wanted to make a, a deeper, but still light brown color, I would take light brown, I would add 15, up to 15 grams of medium brown to it, and then an equal amount of developer. It would still be a light brown color, but it would be a darker version of that original color. Um, so Vincent just said that makes sense. Extra pigment, but no extra developer. Yes. But then look at the second point here. Add seven to 10 grams of, uh, of additional color. In other words, uh, if, for instance, if, if now I took light brown once again, but instead of being equal amounts of peroxide, I put uh, 45, uh, excuse me, 55 grams of color light brown color, but only, excuse me, if I, if I mix together 65 grams of color with only 50, 60 grams of peroxide, I have put additional color into the formula. And by doing so, I increased the depth of the, uh, the final color result. And then, uh, Vincent said, I've done that on clients 
who's here to tend to take light. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point that I'm making, uh, Vincent. Um, adding a little extra color makes, makes the color look deeper. And then the last point here was to add the appropriate amount of color concentrate to the formula. Now, if you look at these, and I don't know how they're going to appear on your computers, but if you look at these four light brown uh, swatches, uh, A, B, C, and D. This first one is the translucent American version of light brown. But then by adding a small amount of concentrate, uh, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, I've switched from the, the American translucent version to the European opaque version of light brown. So you can do this with any color line whatsoever, because remember, um, when working with concentrates, they're, they're universal. They work with any color line. Uh, do I have a, a, a preference? Um, interesting question. Perry asked, do I have a preference uh, over which one that I use, the concentrate over color? Yeah. What I used to do in the old days before concentrates was I would do this top one here. I would do the 15 grams up to 15 grams of the next deep, deeper level uh, of color and then an equal amount of peroxide. Nowadays, I've switched over and now I use color concentrate because it's, it's pure toned. And uh, uh, I know that it's going to, it's gonna simply give me a deeper version without uh, any, uh, any change of the color formula. Um, uh, Luke said universal and add AMP. Yes, um, to Luke's point, if you're going to add uh, any concentrate, it has to be something that's universal and cannot have um, uh, MEA in it. Uh, Perry said he prefers uh, that it adds no, per uh, no peroxide. I think you mean no extra peroxide. Uh, uh, Stephanie asked, is the longevity of a formula the same with concentrates? Um, it, it actually, colors tend to wear slightly better with concentrates or slightly longer. It's the same color, a deeper version of it. And whenever you have a slightly deeper version of a, of a color formula, it will last a little bit longer. Okay. What's next? Oh, okay. I told you this was a quick one today. Any questions um, uh, before we go on? Oh, Sharon says she agrees, especially with purples. Um, uh, that's fascinating. I, I would have never thought of that. Uh, I'm just going to accept that as a truism. Uh, and Sharon says she uses concentrates. Thank you. Good for you, Sharon. Now, considerations before formulae. Before you work with a client for the first time, look closely, look very closely at the, the hair, the eyes, and the skin. Now, by taking these three factors primarily into consideration, they will help create a much better hair color formula. Just these three things to begin with. Now, first of all, the depth and color of the hair. The hair is not level three or level four or level six. If you're thinking in levels, I suggest that you're making a mistake right off the bat. Think in color. Hair is not three or four or six or eight or any other number. Hair is either blonde or brown. It's not auburn, strawberry, red, gold, ash. It's red, excuse me, it's blonde or brown. All of those other things are tones of either blonde or brown. They're not blonde or brown. They're tones of blonde or brown. 
Oh, wait a minute, I have to go back. Uh, Rebecca asked a question. With gray coverage, if 10 volume and regular color formula doesn't cover, what would be your next step to get max coverage? There's, there's multiple answers to this, Rebecca. First of all, um, I don't use 20 volume for gray coverage except on, very, on fine hair. Um, you need 15 or 20 volume um, 15 minimum, 20 volume for regular gray coverage on regular textured hair, you know, average textured hair. Um, that's when I would use a uh, uh, higher volume. Um, uh, then I would go automatically to concentrates. Um, remember that it also, if you're using 10 volume on, for gray coverage and it's not fine hair, in other words, it's regular, regular textured or medium, medium textured hair. You have to go with 10 volume, at least, you've got to go 45 minutes and not 30 or 35. Okay. I hope that, I hope that it, uh, helps. Back down to here. By first thinking of your client as a blonde or a brunette, you're using the right side of your brain. Now, your brain, maybe everyone knows, maybe they don't know. Your brain is, has two different sides to it. One side is the, is the very creative and imaginative side. And the other side is, is, is um, your analytical side. So if you first think of a client as a blonde or a brunette, you're using the right side of your brain. The right side is the creative and imaginative side of your brain, and it allows you to think three-dimensional. If it is the right side of your brain that lets you see a new color or design, um, by envision, I mean see it in your mind's eye um, when you're creating it up, when you're creating it. So if I describe a color as medium strawberry blonde with hints of uh, gold in it, you can picture it when you're using the right side of your brain. You can see a um, strawberry blonde color. But if I describe the same color as a 7RO, which is a medium uh, blonde, uh, reddish, uh, uh, red orangish, which means it has it's it, it appears golden orange. The left side of your brain takes over, and seven R O becomes a number with letters, and you no longer visualize the color. Now, this is a real simple exercise that you can do if you think about color as a blonde or a brunette, and then think about it with tone in it, you can visually see it. But as soon as you switch to a number, you can no longer see it. It's because you're using the other side of your brain um, and it's just, it's just a number. So when teaching a color class, many, most instructors say, what color is the hair? You just look at the hair. And assuming the model has light brown hair, nine out of every 10 participants will say she has level four or level five or level six hair color because they've been taught to think in levels. And that's not right. The one person out of 10 who says she has light brown hair is the one person who's thinking creatively, not analytically. That one person out of 10 is the one who generally, almost always, generally, but almost always, comes up with better color formulas because she's thinking in color, not in, in uh, analytically in numbers. Make sense? I hope so. Oops, all right. Once you determine the natural color of the hair, you can determine what can be done in a single process or if you must use 
more than one process. Now, pastel colors we know almost always require double processing the hair. There are exceptions to that rule. Um, um, and that's when the hair is, is, is um, almost 100% pure white, in which case you can see, although it will not be its regular intensity, a pastel color on white hair. But hair that is naturally blonde can usually be lightened to lightest blonde in a single process. That we know. But hair that is light, um, light brown or lightest brown can usually only been, be lightened to a light or medium blonde in a single process and still control uh, warmth and things like that. When you go beyond that and, and you start, uh, you try to go uh, more than just a couple of levels lighter, then you end up with hair that becomes, uh, begins to become uh, brassy or too warm for the color formula that you've created. Oh, we're moving on. Any more questions? Let me go back. Any, any more questions uh, about be, before we formulate, before we go on to this segment? <laughs> okay. We're going to move on to weighing in, in grams. Now, I weigh and have been weighing color for many, many years. I've been doing it in the salon and color classes everywhere. Because you affect both the final color result and the profit margin. You, is, you also assure a consistent result for your client. So by weighing in grams, you can always have an exact formula that can be easily customized. It can also be easily customized for adjusting the quantity of color that you need. Now, when you adjust the quantity of color, that means you no waste. Less waste means more money in your pocket. And let me explain a little bit further. Here's an example of why weighing is important. If you throw away a half of an ounce of color because you've made a little bit too much and you throw it away eight times a day from, from eight different color applications, this means eight times a half of an ounce or 15 grams gives you uh, a full color application, a full color application. Now, if you throw away a full color application, let's just say five each day, and there's five days in a week, that means you've thrown away five color applications in a week. Now, if you charge $60 for an application, and I know some of you charge much more, some of you charge less, but nevertheless, whatever it is, if you're charging just $60 per application, you've thrown away $300 in color services in that one week. So now multiply it by 50 weeks in a year. And you've thrown away enough product that you could have earned an extra $15,000 at no cost. No cost, because you've already paid for the product that you're throwing away. Now include highlighting. How many times do you, have you seen someone in the salon or even you yourself have thrown away 
a third or a half of a bowl of uh, highlighting mixture. It's just money down the drain. It's, it's additional services that could be completed and you've simply thrown it away. But here's a conversion chart. Now it's not exact. Uh, it's an approximate because uh, uh, two, in, two ounces is not exactly 60 grams, but it's close enough uh, uh, that you can count two ounces of color as 60 grams, uh, a half an ounce as 15 grams. And there's all the numbers in between. So now let's convert this. If I have a regular formula and I'm using an ounce and a half, and I'm just making this up out of the top of my head, um, uh, 4G and a half an ounce of 4RO plus two ounces of developer. And what I have is I have um, uh, a, a total of uh, four ounces uh, of developer. But if I switch it to grams, I have 45 uh, grams of, of 4G, which is an ounce and a half. Remember this chart here, an ounce and a half equals 45 grams, plus 15 grams, which is a half of an ounce, same formula, and 60 grams of developer, same formula. It, it's the identical formula. I just simply switched it from ounces uh, uh, from ounces to grams. But, but what I can do is I can do a much smaller conversion. So let's say that, uh, that I'm only going to do just uh, a touch up and I don't need to do the full head. I don't need to pull color through and I'm just going to touch up the roots. Or let's say that I'm only doing um, a refresh application where I don't need a full color application. So I can take any amount of color, simply mix it in the identical three to one ratio, and I have the exact color formula. Um, Luke said, uh, oh, you know, we did this. Um, when I was when I retired and closed down my salon, but my, sal but my clients were all crazy for a while about, uh, me going to someone else. Um, I, I worked in a salon for the last year doing exactly what you're suggesting. They would put all of the waste um, into a pail. And it was astounding um, uh, uh, how much uh, waste there was uh, in one single week. Um, Rebecca says her scale gets funny when measuring small amounts. Um, I don't know what scale you use, uh, Rebecca, and I just simply know that um, there are many, many of them out there. The one that I, the, the one that I use uh, is both, uh, it re measures in ounces and grams. Uh, uh, it's just an electronic scale that uses regular small batteries. I don't know who the manufacturer is. Uh, all these years, there's so many of them on the market now. And they're so inexpensive. Um, I don't know. I just simply don't know. So. And now steam heat versus dryer heat. Okay. Any, uh, just moving on. Steam heat. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm a big delete a believer in steam heat and once once i found out about steam heat i never put a client under a dryer again ever in in all the years that i was working uh, uh, with hair coloring so <clears throat> first of all the steamers surround the hair with warm moist heat and that warm moist heat shortens the process time, but the fact that it's moist heat prevents the color from drying out and protects the hair from excessive damage. You never place a plastic cap on someone's hair when they're under um, a steamer. Um, 
Vincent asked, is the steamer safe for bleach? We'll talk about that in just a second here. Um, dryers require a plastic cap to prevent the drying of the coloring product. But what happens is when you put a plastic cap on someone's hair with hair color, you are dramatically increasing the possibility of an allergic reaction and you are dramatically increasing the possibility of burns on the scalp. Steamers provide vents that release excessive amounts of steam, whereas dryers are not vented. Now, when I say excessive amounts of steam, I'm talking about when steam is, instead of just surrounding the hair in a warm mantle, what it does is it starts coming down out of the, out of the steamer onto the face and neck of the client. And that's when you start getting um, uh, too much steam. That's what the vents are for, so that you open them a little bit or a lot so that you, you have excessive amounts of steam venting and going away from the face. Well, let me go back here for a second. Let me go back. You notice that I said dryers are not vented. And what I said one second ago was that uh, dryers dramatically increase the possibility of an allergic reaction. The other thing that steam does as it increases the speed of a reaction. Now, I know that people out there use uh, products that are designed to speed up your hair color, and then the clients are put under a dryer. Um, but what, what you're not being told is that the, the dryers are speeding up the reaction not the chemicals that you're putting into the product. That's why it's speeding up. Um, I don't remember whether I talk about it here or later. Well, let me just keep going here for a sec. Here's the way you, you work with the steamer. You, you, you turn the steamer on, you wait about three minutes before you place the client under. There's two reasons for this. First of all, during that three minute wait, the color is seeping into the hair um, uh, into the client's hair. You're also warming up the, the steamer at the same time. Number, you do not place a plastic cap over the, over the hair. And then this one is also very important. You do not pack the hair against the scalp. I have seen so many people uh, do it, uh, pack hair to the scalp. You lift it away from the scalp. This allows two things. Number one, by lifting it away from the scalp, it allows the steam or the warmth to circulate through all the hair. But also, when you pack hair down on the scalp, you are increasing the possibility of an allergic reaction or scalp burns because you've packed it down so tightly. Uh, so don't pack the hair. Uh, number five is make sure all the hair is inside the hood. Otherwise, otherwise if it's not all in the hood, um, you'll sometimes end up with a little bit at the back where the hair doesn't lighten the same as all the rest because you have, uh, the hair is just simply not getting heated in that one spot. Uh, six, adjust for a medium flow of steam. And uh, six, uh, read this part here, uh, which is part of, part of number six. Number seven, if the steam is flowing around the client's face, that means you've got too much steam, I'll adjust the vents on top of the hood to allow the team to escape. Now you process it for 16 to 18 minutes. Um, uh, that's where the heat comes in. You've, in, you've sped up the time of the reaction. Um, I think I spoke about this in the last, uh, uh, last webinar we did when I spoke about 
how dyes and couplers work, the, the vibration, the natural vibration, and it speeds up with, uh, when, you, when you heat uh, a hair color reaction. The reason that it says 16 to 18 minutes means longer time for coarser textured hair. When you take it off, allow the hair color, allow them to cool down for a couple of minutes. Don't rush immediately and, and, and rinse it from the hair. And then if necessary, oh, well, you shampoo the color from the hair and if necessary, then you condition it. But this will give you much, much better. Um, someone is asking um, about uh, uh, steamers. Uh, Stephanie asked, color deposit and longevity isn't compromised. Here's what I found, Stephanie. For those clients that I had problems with longevity of wear, and they were few and far between, but occasionally I would uh, come across someone whose color didn't wear as long as, as this should have. Um, I found out that using, for me, using uh, a steamer caused the color to last longer in their hair. Um, someone's asking what type of steamer, um, and then Kathy recommend a Climazon. Um, I don't know one from the other. I just simply know I used a, a, a steamer in the salon. Uh, I looked it up online, and um, it had vents in the top. It had uh, a color tank for holding the water, and it had the first, the first switch turned it on um, and then caused a, just an, a little bit amount of heat. But the second switch, if you, you, if you turn down the second switch on the one I was using, um, it, caused it, it caused the water to, uh, uh, to boil faster, uh, causing more steam to happen. Because remember, the temperature doesn't change um, with the steam. It's consistent all the time. Uh, you just change the the reaction by uh, opening the vents in the top of the steamer so um, that's what i i just don't, i don't remember the name of what i used but here for foil highlights this is the this is when i used a dryer i used to put i used to put uh foil highlights under a regular dryer and not, um, uh, not a steamer. Uh, but what most people didn't realize is uh, that if the dryer is too high, that's what caused the leaks from the foils that caused both discoloration of the hair and um, occasionally burning on the scalp itself. So it's okay to use a dryer for foil highlights. Just make sure the dryer is set on low temperature. Stephanie also asked, is uh, infrared heat uh, comparable to the regular dryer? Yes, I use that also in the salon. Um, uh, um, I used infrared heat uh, primarily um, uh, for highlighting after I stopped using a uh, dryer heat for highlighting. When, when the lamps, uh, heat lamps became available, I switched from uh, dryer heat to uh, 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 heat lamps. And then I don't know if there's any more. Oh, no, I told you this was a real, this was a quick and short one. This was only 40 minutes we've been talking. Um, so I'm going to open it up. Uh, are they less damaging? Wait a minute. Um, I'm going to, I'm opening it up to questions before we go on. Um, Stephanie asked, um, are they less damaging? The damage, remember, comes from the strength of the peroxide primarily. Um, when you increase the speed of a, uh, a color reaction by, um, by adding heat to it, it also increases um, slightly the damage factor because you're working uh, faster 
uh, you're working uh, in a shorter period of time, you're doing the same amount of work. So yes, you do get a slight increase by adding heat to a, um, uh, uh, to a color reaction, but not enough if it's, if it's moist heat and if it's warm heat, not enough to be a major concern uh, when working. Now, next week, we're gonna talk about toners and Tony, how to work with color concentrates to your advantage, regardless of the color line that you're using, how you can go about creating your own tones of color. Now, um, wait, Rebecca asked another question. Rebecca asked, do volumizing products fade color faster by opening the cuticle? Um, I assume you're talking about, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about finishing products. And most finishing products have a lower pH that don't uh, really open the cuticle. Um, they're simply um, for, for giving volume uh, when, when doing uh, finishing work. Um, the answer is, I believe the answer is no. I don't know volumizing products that, uh, that fade color faster, uh, unless there's something that a real high pH. Um, uh, Stephanie asked, uh, are infrared lamps for speeding color or just steam? Uh, both. You can do both with infrared lamps. Uh, and Tracy asked, is there any way she can watch? Yeah, Tracy, just simply go to the, uh, 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 either the worldwide website or um, go to the um, uh, YouTube. They're posted in both places. Uh, under Tom Dispenza. Um, oh, volumizing shampoo. Rebecca asked about volumizing shampoo. Um, I don't, it depends upon the pH, Rebecca. The higher the pH of a shampoo, the more that you open the cuticle layer. Um, however, most shampoos are still, are even volumizing shampoos, I believe are still uh, formulated within the neutral range, which means below um, 8.0. Um, they should have very little effect on, uh, uh, on holding, uh, on, on um, causing color fadage. Um, part eight, uh, what else was I saying? Oh, uh, creating uh, tones. Now, this is how you create blended tones how anyone can create their own blended tones in a salon. And then um, after we're talking about uh, um, blended tones, warm neutrals. There are a couple different ways uh, that you could create warm neutral colors. And uh, we will talk about them in uh, 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 next time around. So it's all about uh, creating tone, tonalities uh, and uh, toning and toning colors. Um, other than that, if there's no more questions, um, I think that I have, let me see. Yep, there's my famous book. For those of you that are interested, uh, just go to uh, tomdispenza.com if you're in the US, if you want to order it. And um, uh, Guy Carey, Guy raised his hand. Um, okay, Guy, your, your hand is raised, why? Are you asking a question? Um, go ahead and ask a question if you have a question. And then outside the US, uh, you go to amazon.com. So let me go back up here to the very first swatch so that, uh, let me go back up here to the very first swatch. Okay, and then hit this, and there you are again. Uh, There you go, everyone. Um, I don't know why it says part seven. I'm not doing part seven. 
Uh, I just, oh no, that's the one I just did. Um, remember that this is my email if you want to send me an email. Uh, it, the Worldwide Hair Colors Association.org is what I was talking about um, uh, uh, for. Um, Stephanie, okay, here's some really interesting questions. Stephanie asked, why is there no V in your deposit only color for toning? Uh, very simple. Um, most V's, uh, whoops, most V's are not um, uh, true V's. Most of them are actually blue violet. I just tell the truth. Uh, and even if you had a V, remember, uh, violet will only um, eliminate lightest, uh, the very lightest yellow color. It will neutralize it and give you a color that is uh, neutral or are very white looking. Um, but if you have blue violet, and the blue is adjusted, so there's actually very little blue in the blue violet when you're at lighter tones. You can create platinum and you can create silver colors, um, but without blue, you can't. You can only create, you can only neutralize pale yellow. That's why uh, I created it that way. Uh, Kimberly said she's been using the, the book for class. Thank you. Uh, I had a, a oh, wow, um, uh, Lisa, that light brown book is out of print. And uh, I sold thousands of that light brown book many, many years ago when it first came out. I think I started it, I think it was from 20 years ago. Um, most of the information uh, is, is still pretty accurate, but as time has gone on, uh, I've learned more and more and more about uh, color. And uh, uh, that's, that's where it's, all this information comes from. Um, what volume developer is safe to use when decolorized under heat? Okay, now, uh, Allison, uh, first of all, Decolorization of hair. Uh, I don't think I've ever spoken about decolorization of hair because I don't make any products uh, that do it. However, um, when I did it, I would use, I would do it, go about it in two different ways. Number one, if the hair has already been colored uh, and you want to decolorize it, I would use in the salon, I would use um, a product that reduced the color to its uh, individual components and then it would wash out of the hair. Um, uh, the one that I used for many, many years was from Rusk. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but it was from Rusk. Um, it's also made, uh, I, I think Pravana makes one also that's very, very good. I don't remember who else makes them. But the second way to do it is if you want to slightly decolorize the hair just a little bit, mix powder lightener with water. Oh, eliminate. Yes, I remember that, Luke. Um, uh, mix powder lightener with water. Now, persulfates destroy um, uh, hair color. Uh, that's why you don't ever put persulfates in a bowl, you never put powder lightener in a bowl because it immediately um, uh, go on to uh, de destroying the molecules. Um, however, um, uh, if you're using water with powder lightener and you're using it at the sink on damp hair, it will slightly lighten the hair color that's too dark. And, but if you, if you, if you use it, put it on the hair long term, or uh, just leave it on the hair, it will decolorize the hair slowly, but it takes uh, quite a bit of time. I, I preferred using the, the decolorizers. Oh, um, Suzanne says that Pravana doesn't make theirs any longer. Pity. Um, uh, 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 let me see, where was I up here? 
uh, proportions on top of page 54. Okay, hold on a second here. I'm going to get a book and uh, let me look at it. Hang on. Page 54, 47, 50, 52, 53, 54. Oh, uh, concentrates. That first top picture that showed all of the different concentrates, um, um, I used uh, 20 volume uh, with pure concentrates. But on the second and third one of each grouping, I used uh, less concentrate. Um, if you look here, uh, go down one one page to so what you see is uh, the first section where it shows uh, uh, the light the um, the brown one. And it says 60 grams of neutral concentrate. The second one says 30 and 30 grams of clear. And the third one says 15 grams of concentrate and 45 grams of clear. What I did in each one of those uh, instances is I mixed it with 20 volume because you would normally be mixing a 20 volume developer. And so I just did it the same, the same way that I did it with a, uh, uh, in a color formula. And um, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay. uh, Malibu, um, I, I happen to like uh, Malibu products. Uh, and uh, I've known Tom, the guy who owns Malibu products for many, many, many years um, for shifting. I don't know what that, I don't know what shifting color means. Um, uh, Edelson and I, and then Sharon said, apparently Sharon has been using powder lightener with warm water is a great alternative when you're looking for a small amount of color removing. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharon. Um, uh, malleable products for color shifting, for shifting color. Um, Oh, oh, uh, Allison, I don't know. I, I don't know what their product is if it goes too dark. I don't know what it is. Uh, purple shampoos, I, I don't use them because I think, I don't think anybody should make a, a purple shampoo. Um, however, my business partner in Chromastics thinks differently. He wants me to produce a purple shampoo. Um, uh, uh, here's the reason I don't, I don't use purple shampoos. Um, if, if you're using a purple shampoo and it's on hair that was highlighted, uh, then what you're doing is you're using the purple over all the head, not just uh, that part of it. And then secondly, um, I prefer toners because toners um, last for weeks and weeks and weeks longer than a purple shampoo does, which only goes from, from shampoo to shampoo. Um, however, um, uh, the more the more often that you use purple shampoo uh, on um, a hair that has been uh, either color treated or um, has been bleached, you slowly cause more of the. Even though it's supposed to be uh, wash out after one application, it it does last longer and eventually will stain the hair and give you a purple residue that's left in hair that particularly hair that's bleached. Um, I'm a much, I, I'm, I'm a toner guy. I don't use purple shampoos and never have in the salon. Um, however, that once again becomes uh, a, a personal reference, a personal point for you and your clients. Um, Okay, I don't know what happened here. Escape. Oh, there we go. We're back up here. 
that was the first slide. Um, uh, um, can't. Once again, everyone. Uh, okay, what? Here's another question from Susan. When you've had a stubborn gray hairline, I've used the color one level lighter method on stubborn gray, then applied to the regular color eventually. Um, and that's actually something that I learned many, many years ago, except what we learned, um, here's a, a bunch of different ways for stubborn. Now, when you say gray, I'm assuming you mean white uh, because there's no such thing as gray hair. Hair is either white or pigmented. Um, so here's what we did. And what, what I learned in beauty school 40 years ago was we would take a very small amount of dark blonde golden shade and, and we were using liquid color in those days. Uh, we would apply it with a Q-tip to the white hair before we put uh, the regular color on. We would wait it just a minute and then we put the regular color on top of it. So what we were doing in fact was we were increasing the dye load by putting the, the regular, uh, by putting uh, the dark golden blonde color on first without any developer in it. That increased the dye load. Uh, and because we were using a Q-tip and just painting a tiny bit on it, it didn't dramatically affect the color other than to make the hair more, more uh, acceptable for the color. And the reason it did that was because the pH of the product brought the pH of the hair up first and then allowed the other color to penetrate uh, more easily. We used to also do it in 40 years ago with a very small amount of permanent wave solution. So we would do the same thing. We would take a Q-tip, dip it into a permanent wave solution and then vent, very gently paint it onto the, uh, the stubborn white hair and then we'd put the color over it and we always had really good um, uh, gray coverage. Uh, on that note, guys, guess what? It's time to say goodbye once again. <laughs>